Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon. May I kindly ask you to take your seats, please. Thank you. I declare the 11th emergency special session of the General Assembly resumed. Before proceeding further, I would like to remind members that all meeting participants are encouraged to consider wearing a mask while indoors, including in the General Assembly Hall and in, in conference, uh, conference rooms. Members will recall that in paragraph 3 of its resolution ES 11 slash 3 of 7th of April 2022, the Assembly decided, I quote, to adjourn the 11th emergency special session of the General Assembly temporarily and to authorize the President of the General Assembly to resume its meetings upon request from member states, end of quote. In this regard, I should like to draw the attention of the delegations to document A slash ES 11 slash 8, which contains a letter dated 3rd of October 2022 from the permanent representatives of Albania and Ukraine to the United Nations requesting the resumption of the 11th emergency se uh, special session of the General Assembly. I intend to conduct the proceedings of this meeting in accordance with the rules of procedure of the General Assembly and the past practices of its emergency special sessions. In accordance with Rule 63 of the rules of procedure of the General Assembly, the President and Vice Presidents of the 77th session shall serve in the same capacity at the resumed 11th emergency special session. May I take it that it is the wish of the General Assembly to decide that the Credentials Committee of the 77th session should serve for the resumed 11th emergency special session. It is so decided. In keeping with established practice, I should now like to invite the attention of the General Assembly to document A slash ES 11 slash 9 concerning member states that are in areas in the payment of their financial contributions to the United Nations within the terms of Article 19 of the Charter. May I take it that the Assembly duly takes note of the information contained in this document? It is so decided. In this connection, may I further take it that it is the wish of the General Assembly to follow the provisions of the Resolution 77-2 of 7th of October 2022, by which the Comoros, Sao Tome and Principe, and Somalia are permitted to vote in the General Assembly until the end of, the, of its 77th session, and to also allow these member states to vote at the 11th emergency special session. It is so decided. The General Assembly will now resume its consideration of Agenda Item 5, entitled Letter, uh, uh, quote, Letter dated 28th of February 2014 from the Permanent Representative of Ukraine to the United Nations, 
addressed to the President of the Security Council, S-2014-136. End of quote. In this connection, the Assembly has before, before it a draft resolution contained in document A slash ES 11 slash L5. I give the floor to the representative of Albania on point of order. Thank you, President. I have a point of order to raise before we proceed with agenda item five of the 11th emergency special session. We would like to propose that the General Assembly adopts a decision confirming that the General Assembly will apply rule 87B of the rules of procedure to take recorded vote by electronic means when action is taken on the resolution L5 and that action will not be taken by a secret ballot. The reason for this proposed decision is that Russia has circulated a proposal to all member states formally requesting that action on the resolution be through a secret ballot. In the interest of avoiding confusion, the GA should clarify this issue now. Russia's proposal is an attempt to threaten transparency in the GA. Wouldn't we all want transparency from the international community if a neighboring country invaded and attempted to annex a portion of our territory? Would any member state of the GA support a secret ballot if it was their own territory that someone was trying to annex? The Russian Federation is citing as precedent a 1977 decision to hold the secret ballot in the UNGA. That decision only applies to the narrow choice of the venue for a UN session. In fact, the rest of the resolution was not decided by secret ballot. Indeed, it was adopted by consensus. The decision that Russian Federation cites is not applicable as precedent. A decision on a venue is similar to a decision to elect member states or individuals to UN bodies, which are held by secret ballot. There is no precedent for the GA to hold the secret ballot on a non-venue issue, let alone on an important question of international peace and security. For the entire history of the UN, substantive resolutions such as the one we have before us today have been held by a recorded vote as provided in the rules of procedure. Therefore, there is no basis for suspending the rules of procedure on voting. We should not play with words and we should not establish dangerous precedents. Even if it is legally possible to suspend the rules of procedure, it is entirely unjustified for this resolution. To conduct a secret ballot on a GA decision would go against decades of precedent and undermine the practices of the world's most representative deliberative body. In this case, we request all member states to vote in favor of our proposed decision to confirm that Rule 87B will apply when action is taken on the draft resolution L5, and that action will not be taken by secret ballot. I thank you. I thank the representative of Albania. The representative of Albania has moved that decision on draft resolution A slash ES 11 slash L5 be made by a recorded vote pursuant to Rule 87 of the Rules of Procedure, which provides that, I quote, any representative may request a recorded vote, end of quote, and not by secret ballot. Now I give the floor to the representative of the Russian Federation. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, uh, 
do not uh, entirely understand what it is that the representative of Albania is referring to, nor do I understand what it is that displeases the representative of Albania when it comes to secret ballot and how it comes in contradiction with the principles of democracy that she is uh, um, preaching. The Russian Federation, I would like to draw your attention to this, the Russian Federation has not yet raised uh, the issue having to do with a secret ballot on the resolution. We were planning to do that immediately before uh, the passing of the resolution, but the fact that Albania raised uh, was talking about a one single procedural possibility in 87B, in other words, requesting a recorded vote, whereas my delegation was planning and is planning to raise the issue of making a decision by a secret ballot by suspending the Rule 87 as a whole. In order to understand whether or not uh, the procedure ID 87B can be used, we need to find out first whether or not this rule is being active or suspended. And therefore, of course, uh, the first proposal that needs to be considered is a Russian proposal. Any other order of consideration would make no sense. But even if, against all logic, the decision is made to first uh, vote on an individual point under eight, on 87 point B, we would like to immediately underscore the following. This does not prejudge or cancel the consideration of a self-standing proposal of my delegation, which consists of suspending the rule of 87 as a whole so as to conduct a secret ballot. And we will introduce such a proposal. I thank you. The representative of the Russian Federation has made an objection to the motion. Pursuant to Rule 71 of the Rules of Procedure, the point of order shall be immediately decided. I shall now put to the recorded vote the motion by the representative of Albania that decision on draft resolution A slash ES 11 slash L5 be made by a recorded vote and not by secret ballot. The recorded vote on this motion will be decided by a simple majority of members present and voting. We shall now begin the voting process. Those in favor of the motion by the representative of Albania that decision on draft resolution A slash ES 11 slash L5 be taken by a recorded vote and not by secret ballot. The delegation of the Syrian Arab Republic is asking for the floor. I'll give the floor if it is only on the conduct of the vote. Shukran. Thank you, Mr. President. In fact, what I understood from the Russian Federation's request is that they will propose the suspension of an, an article and not uh, uh, of the rule and not uh, the secret ballot, but your decision to continue and proceed with Albania's uh, proposal was the reaction. If my understanding was correct, the Russian Federation requested something different and did not propose the issue of a secret ballot. I hope to clarify this situation. So let me continue. Thank you much for the intervention. Let me continue. Uh, the recorded vote on this motion will be decided by a simple majority of member states present and voting. We shall now begin the voting process. 
those in favor of the motion by the representative of Albania that decision on draft resolution A slash ES 11 slash L5 be taken by a recorded vote and not by secret ballot, please signify. Those against? Abstentions? Members are reminded that at this stage, the General Assembly is voting on the motion of the representative of Albania and not on the draft resolution itself. The General Assembly is now voting on the motion by the representative of Albania, the decision on draft resolution A stroke ES 11 slash L5 be taken by recorded vote and not by secret ballot. Those who vote yes will be voting in favor of the use of a recorded vote as proposed by Albania. Those who vote no will be voting against the motion proposed by Albania and in favor, it, and in favor of a secret ballot. Will all delegations confirm that their votes are accurately reflected on the screen? The voting has completed. Please lock the machine. The result of the vote is as follows. In favor, 107, against 13, abstention, 39. The motion by the representative of Albania is adopted. The General Assembly, therefore, will take decision on draft resolution A slash ES 11 slash L5 by a recorded vote after the de debate on the item. We shall now continue with a debate on agenda item five. Excellencies, the war in Ukraine should have been never started, but it will end one day. Guns will be silent, but when? At what cost? How many people will have died? How many families separated? how much more suffering endured. What will Ukraine look like when peace returns? And what will the world look like? So many lives have been lost. So much has been destroyed in there will be no victors in this war. Everyone will lose. Flambe. Food prices are skyrocketing. Famine are thre is threatening communities throughout the world. General, for leading on the Black Sea Grain Initiative. وقد أدت هذه الصفقة. This deal mediated by the United Nations has led to liberating six million tons at least of food. More, a quarter of which is delivered directly to low-income countries. We shall act together 
to achieve the full implementation of this initiative. And it is imperative that we secure its removal, renewal beyond mid-November. Excellencies, as the horrors in Ukraine were not enough, we are forced to live with the constant fear of nuclear disaster. I commend the work of the IAEA to ensure the safety of nuclear plants in the war zone. The IAEA has warned there is, I quote, playing with fire, end of quote. When it comes to nuclear issues, any irresponsible action or statement is unacceptable. And any threat of using nuclear weapons should be universally condemned. The UN Charter is clear. The General Assembly has been clear. The Secretary General has been clear. Aggression is illegal. The GE resolution of 14th of December 1974 defines aggression as the use of armed force by a state against the sovereignty, territorial integrity, or political independence of another state. This act is called as inconsistent with the Charter. Invading a neighbor is illegal. Article 4 of the UN Charter states that, I quote, all members shall refrain in their international relations from the threat or use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of any state. End of quote. Annexing territories of other countries by force is illegal. The G resolution of 24th of October 1970 the Declaration on Principles of International Law Concerning Friendly Relations and Cooperation Among States has reinforced that the territory of a state shall not be object of acquisition by another state using from, uh, resulting from a threat or use of force. It is incompatible with the purposes and principles of the Charter. And as the Secretary General pointed out, the referenda in the occupied regions, I quote, cannot be called a genuine expression of the popular will, end of quote. When it comes a daily routine to watch images of destroyed cities and scattered bodies, we lose our humanity we must find a political solution based on the UN Charter and the international law. We need to keep the door open for diplomacy. The fighting between Russia and Ukraine must stop. As the General Assembly has decided in its resolution adopted on March the 2nd, 2022, I quote, Troops of the Russian Federation must be withdrawn from the territory of Ukraine within its internationally recognized borders, end of quote. What is the alternative? A world without shared rules. A world without peace. A world without future. We must recommit to the values, principles, and purposes of the Charter. If we want to move forward as a global community, we must provide answers. The world is looking to us. Thank you.
Now I give the floor to the distinguished representative of Ukraine to introduce draft resolution A slash ES 11 slash L5. Good afternoon. It's going to be a very difficult task for me today, for many reasons. It's barely 4 p.m. in New York, but my day has started almost 14 hours ago. It started 14 hours ago because my country was under attack my immediate family was in a residential building under attack, unable to go to a bomb shelter because there was no electricity. Because Russia has already killed some of my family members. And we see no end to that cruelty. But let me start with a quote from a very respected gentleman in his country. From the president who was the first president ever directly elected in his country in a democratic way. And that is Jose Serrato, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Uruguay at the sixth plenary meeting of the UN Conference on International Organization in San Francisco on May the 1st, 1945, and I quote, a stable and sane peace cannot be attained if nothing is done for the democratization of the world and the rule of freedom. Peace and democracy constitute complementary objectives, each of which is a guarantee and a motive for the either. In this regard, in the proposed international organization, there should not be admitted nations professing doctrines of aggression and war, which are inclined to undermine or destroy the order of juridical peace in the world. However, in order to be a member of international society, it is not enough to present the titles of peace-loving nations, but it is also necessary to be a freedom-loving nation." End of quote. Jose Serrato of Uruguay. This is how our predecessor, predecessors saw the way to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war at the dawn of our organization. 77 years ago. Unfortunately, you can hardly hope for a stable and sane peace as long as an unstable and insane dictatorship exists in your vicinity. A dictatorship that actively uses missile terror against the civilian population and infrastructure of another state. Today, terrorist Russia shelled the capital city of Kiev and many other Ukrainian cities throughout the country with at least 84 missiles and two dozen UAVs. Energy facilities, residential buildings, schools and universities, museums and crossroads in the city centers were among the targets that the Russian Defense Ministry later declared legitimate. The entire world has once again seen the true face of the terrorist state that kills our people. Suffering defeats on the battlefield, Russia takes it out on the peaceful residents of Ukrainian cities. Today's strike killed at least 14 civilians and 97 were wounded. Deliberate targeting of civilians 
is a war crime. By launching missile attacks on civilians, sleeping in their homes, or rushing to work, children going to schools, Russia has proven once again that it is a terrorist state that must be deterred in the strongest possible ways. We need this to prevent further heinous atrocities and to secure our achievements within this organization. The UN has survived many challenges, including bloc confrontation and Soviet threats. In this very hall, addressed to the world, threats addressed to the UN and its Secretary General. As King Hussein of Jordan said in 1960, standing exactly where I am right now, and I quote, yet almost from the birth, Soviet Union has sought to destroy the United Nations, to hamper its deliberations, to block its decisions, to demean the reputation of the Security Council and the Secretary and, and the General Assembly. End of quote. I signed under each of these words in 2022, standing exactly where the leader of Jordan was 62 years ago. What we are witnessing now is an attempt by Russia to revive the so-called Brezhnev Doctrine envisaging that the Soviet Union could limit the principle of prohibition of the use of force if, it is, if its interest in other states within so-called zone of influence were challenged. Incompatibility of this doctrine with the UN Charter was clear even for the Soviet Union. And at the end of the day, the USSR had to officially give it up. Let me quote President Gorbachev. It is evident, for example, that force and the threat of force can no longer be and should not be instruments of foreign policy, said the, the then Soviet president. In this very hall in December 1988. These words, however, mean nothing for modern Russia, who is occupying the USSR permanent seat at the Security Council and thus is allowed to block any action by the Council to restore international peace and security. Mr. President, Russia now tries its best to bring us back to the 1930s, not even 1940s. When Hitler destroyed sovereign nations by invasion, fake referendums, and Anschluss. And we are now at a tipping point where the United Nations will either restore its credibility or it will ultimately fall in failure. And if, if the latter happens, we should blame nobody but ourselves because it is our responsibility to defend the principles of the UN Charter. A trail of blood is left behind the Russian delegation when it enters the General Assembly. And the hall is filled up with the smell of smoldering human flesh. That's what we have tolerated too long in Syria that's what is happening today in Ukraine. Same dicta dictator in the Kremlin, same Russian generals well known for scorched earth tactics in wars led in Syria and in Chechnya and today in Ukraine. Since 23rd September, Russia has been committing another crime against international law and its principles committing it in an attempt to revive the world of the past, where sovereignty, territorial integrity, and the inviolability of borders were a privilege 
with limited access, not the right of every nation. The sham referendums in four Ukrainian regions followed by unlawful decisions by the Russian president and, the, and the parliament served this very purpose and thus posed an existential threat to the United Nations and its charter. Ukrainians can tell you what our world will look like if this erosion of the UN's credibility is not stopped. If complete disregard for the UN Charter by a country occupying a permanent seat in the Security Council meets any response but zero tolerance. Death, human suffering and destruction are immediate outcomes. As it was in the city of Zaporizhia on the night of the 9th of October when Russia fired over 20 missiles on residential areas which killed at least 13 and injured 60 civilians, including six children. And let me remind you that Zaporizhia is the main city of one of the four regions that Russia has claimed following the sham referendums. Moscow has even included the reference to Zaporizhia in its constitution. Please forgive me use of the term constitution in relation to that worthless piece of paper. It is indeed hard, if not impossible, for a normal human being to comprehend the logic of Putin and his cronies. First, you claim the seizure of an area of a neighboring sovereign state under the pretext of protection of local population. And then you kill this population with dozens of missiles. It is clear, however, that the so-called sham referendum served as an element of the Russian aggression against Ukraine, an element that was hastily prepared and implemented in response to the successful process of liberation of the occupied territories by the army of Ukraine. The so-called referendums bore no relation at all with what we are used to calling expression of the popular will neither from the legal perspective nor from the technical modalities. We are grateful to the Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, who was very clear and explicit in his condemnation of the Russian actions. And as he said, I quote, any decision to proceed with the annexation would have no legal value and deserves to be condemned it cannot be reconciled with the international legal framework. It stands against everything the international community is meant to stand for. It flouts the purposes and principles of the United Nations. It must not be accepted, end of quote, said the Secretary General. Distinguished colleagues, Ukraine is the, in, indeed, is the immediate target of the Russian attacks on the ground. But it is not Ukraine that Russia ultimately aims at. Let me reiterate it again. It is our future that is now at stake. The future that cannot be secured by separate countries or regional arrangements if the United Nations is relegated to the backstage of global processes. Let me recall that the very first purpose of this organization, which is enshrined in Article 1 of its charter, is to maintain international peace and security and to do that, and to that end, to take effective collective measures for the prevention and removal of threats to the peace and for the suppression of acts of aggression. Paragraph 4 of Article 2 of the Charter constitutes the most important principle with regards to the above-mentioned purpose. In particular, we are speaking about the threat and use of force against the territorial integrity and political independence of Ukraine. Violation of Paragraph 4 of Article 2 of the Charter is a violation of the cornerstone of the peace in the Charter, the heart of the Charter, and even basic rule 
of contemporary international law as it has been labeled in legal writings. Dear colleagues, the only thing that Russia is afraid of is our strong unity of purpose in defense of the UN Charter. In defense of the right of every country to benefit from respect for its sovereignty and territorial integrity. We have to save the United Nations. Not for the sake of this whole high-level weeks or other procedural and protocol issues that have been our routine since 1945. We need to do it for the sake of ourselves, as most of us will find ourselves extremely vulnerable and unprotected if the Russian vision of the future prevails. A future where only nuclear power, size of the armed forces, and number of warships and aircraft matter. How many of you would feel safe and secure in such a world? How many of you would deprive your children of the right to, f to freely decide their own future? The answer seems obvious, and we have to rally around the UN Charter and to reconfirm that its principles remain a strong shield to protect all nations. Large or small, members of alliances or neutral ones on all continents. That was the spirit of our common commitment to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war. The spirit that guided our predecessors in San Francisco 77 years ago. The same spirit should guide us now, in particular during the vote on the draft resolution, Territorial Integrity of Ukraine, defending the principles of the UN Charter. As I started my intervention with a quote from Uruguay, and to illustrate what unites us all, even if countries are 10,000 kilometers apart. Let me finish with a quote from the French Foreign Minister, Georges Bidot, at the conference in San Francisco in 1945. And I quote, Justice is another word we must reinstate in all its loftiness. Justice in keeping with international democracy. Justice which gave us, gives full recognition to the rights of all countries, including those which do not come under the generally recognized term of great powers. A point I would particularly stress, said the French foreign minister in San Francisco. It will be a vote for the UN Charter, for each country, for each of our citizens, for your families, for your children. A vote for justice. And I urge you to support the draft. I thank you very much. I thank the distinguished uh, representative of Ukraine. And now I give the floor to the distinguished representative of the Russian Federation. Colleagues, I would like to start with procedural issues. You have all just now witnessed an outrageous fraud, which, to our great regret, um, the President of the General Assembly played a key role. We were not given the floor and the point of order. 
and uh, uh, you can see that the light is still on behind our nameplate. Our statement was distorted, and what is being done now is uh, deprive the members of the United Nations of the right to express their, their opinion. This is an unprecedented manipulation. It undermines the prestige of the General Assembly and the UN as a whole. Of course, under these conditions, we did not vote. We would like to state that we protest in the strongest possible words uh, the violation of the rules of procedure. As I said, the Russian delegation was not given the floor, and what we wanted to say was something that our Syrian colleagues reminded us of. We were not protesting the president's decision. Our issue was a different one. We did not make the proposal that Albania brought into question. Therefore, you, Mr. President, deprived Russia and the of the possibility of presenting their proposal and explaining it. Instead of that, um, our opponents took our place. Is this the kind of transparency and the kinds of practices uh, that the delegation of Albania went on and on about? Is this fair play? We demand that the issue be presented the way we said uh, any action against what we didn't introduce is devoid of any sense, and I will revert to that later. Mr. President and distinguished colleagues, the General Assembly was created as a universal and the most inclusive platform for equal dialogue of sovereign states. In this whole Many a momentous decision was passed, which formed um, the legal, socio-economic, cultural uh, outlines of the international community. And the development of this decision was on the basis of looking for a common denominator compromises and guided by the spirit of cooperation and interaction. Unfortunately, within the walls of the UN, something very different is being witnessed, such cynicism, confrontation, and danger, dangerous polarization as today we have never seen in the history of the UN. And this is uh, particularly clear at this session, the politicized nature of which stems from the fact that it is convened specifically to push forward a narrative against one state, the Russian Federation. All other aspects of the Ukrainian crisis, the uh, foundations for, it, for which were laid by the Western states uh, um, at least in 2014, but actually long before then, are being left outside of the scope of the discussion. It's as though they hadn't been at anti-constitutional Maidan coup, the tragedy in Odessa, depriving the Russian speakers of their rights, the aggression of the Kiev regime against Donbass. Mass um, and ma mass mergers of its inhabitants in Washington, in London, in Brussels, and a number of other capitals. People are trying to stop the clock to pretend uh, that history has only begun on, in February 2022. In the West, any period of history um, starts from the time that's convenient for them as a pretext for the resumption of the special session. A very low-grade provocations were used in the Security Council. We were uh, proposed that we vote for a document which is condemning us ourselves. What does this have to do with peace and security or trying to settle conflicts? This was yet once uh, one more step towards division and escalation, which I am sure is not something that the absolute majority of states in this room need. Those who are following the discussions in the Security Council know very well that we stood ready to agree a balanced and constructive draft in which we propose that we also state an, appe an appeal for a diplomatic resolution of the crisis. Our proposals were reacted to positively in many a partner within a Security Council, but the Western camp obviously ended up not needing them. As we hear from their statements, peace in Ukraine is not something they need in principle. NATO, with which we um, encountered in Ukraine, only needs the escalation in a conflict at a step towards their plan that they have been working on for many years, namely to overcome, to be victorious, or at least severely undermine Russia. 
And Ukraine was used, was chosen by these countries for that purpose, was brought under their control, and today is a platform for the testing of NATO weaponry and for a combat against Russia using other people down to the last Ukraine. Their geopolitical projects aimed at keeping their domination, the domination of Western states, maintaining the well-being of the so-called golden billion is something that they're trying to involve as many countries as possible into. Distinguished colleagues, just as earlier we were um, um, accused when we tried to save the peoples of um, Asia, Africa, and Latin America from colonialism and exploitation. Here, once again, we are being accused when we are trying to protect our brothers and sisters in, in uh, eastern Ukraine. Their right to life, first and foremost, the right to speak their language, to teach their children in their language, to honor the heroes who liberated their lands from fascism, rather those who co collaborated with them and helped kill peaceful citizens. Those whom the current Ukrainian leadership called specimen, subhumans, and told them to get out and go to Russia for the future of their children and grandchildren. Those who heard the um, appeal and decided to move to Russia. And this is shown by the choice made by the millions of people during the referendum in DNR, LNR, in Zaporozhye, and in Kherson, where the absolute majority of those who voted supported the idea of having these regions accede to Russia. In our days, when uh, um, all kinds of videos and comments are available in the social net networks, it's very difficult to counter the fact that this was a free expression of the people of, of people's will, fully in line with, in, with, in, with uh, international rule of law uh, rules. Um, and this was confirmed by hundreds of observers, including Western observers, and also internet users, a uh, majority uh, of this viewed. Um, the survey, surveys in, in the Internet show that most responders think that we need to respect the rights of those people to determine their future. Kiev and its Western backers who covered up the crimes of the Maidan Authority all these eight and a half years disagree with this. Those who uh, claim that the referenda are illegitimate because the Kiev regime didn't agree with them had the exactly opposite stance when they spoke in the international court in favor of Kosovo separating from Serbia. Separation without any referenda just on the basis of the statement about massive killings of the Albanians. And these are the affirmations which we all know today were as far from the truth as uh, the um, glass vial held by Colin Powell, Powell in Security Council when he was talking about weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. The cynicism here consists also of the fact today that those who are screaming about the UN Charter being violated by Russia did not uh, remember this document for many years of trying to replace us with, uh, um, with a rules-based order. Unlike the situation in Kosovo, the rights and the lives of people in DNR, LNR, Kherson, and Zaporozhye are indeed being threatened today. They need protecting them, giving them certainty um, in their future can only be done through a very clear legal status of those regions and accession to the Russian Federation. As was the case in 2014, we saved the people in the Crimea who who were threatened with Ukrainizations and reprisals by Kiev. That is why we undertook that step. We understood how outraged our opponents will be by it. And today, the threat from the Ukrainian nationalists is even serious. The Kiev regime is being supplied with Western weapons every day, and uh, they keep um, using them against those residential areas which never used to be um, reached by the Ukrainian armed forces. There is also terror, open terror, against the civilians by the Ukrainian regime against those whom they call collaborationists. The Kiev uh, fighters are openly admitting this to the Western mass media, and they boast and gloat, saying that they're shooting the Russian collaborators as though they were pigs, end of quote. This is not a metaphor. As was shown in a video by the former command, commander of the Azov Battalion, Zhurin, 
in Kupansk, people are being executed and thrown into pits. Have you heard about the Ukrainian armed forces against a, a strike which was uh, similarly to Dr. Goebbels, w w was, was assigned to the Russian forces. The Ukrainian nationalists have behind them a wake, um, a trail of provocations in Irpin and Bucha, where in April the Russian forces left as a goodwill gesture. And from Izum now, where Kiev is trying to play, try to play out the same scenario. In the east and the south of Ukraine, peaceful civilians are dying, and the people in the Kherson and in Zaporozhye know that very well, and that's why they decided to opt for the future with Russia. And I call upon you to respect their choice. In distinguished colleagues, we call on the international community to pay attention not just to the criminal acts, but also to the responsible steps made by the Kiev regime. These steps are trying to, in order, act against Russia to involve the countries of NATO into that. The appeals by Zelensky to deliver a preventive nuclear strike against Russia. Clearly, the Kiev expecting that if this happens, uh, that they will avoid the inevitable defeat on the battlefield and avoid responsibility for their crimes. But what is th what these appeals are threatening all of us with World War III and nuclear disaster? And the evidence of what the Kiev regime can do is the is a sabotage of the Crimea bridge. We warned that this will not be conducted with impunity. When you do these acts of sabotage, when you kill those who are unfavorable to you, the Kiev regime is on the same level with the most outrageous terrorist organizations. Um, only it's so that the Kiev regime and the Western backers who are um, trying to make sure that there is war until the very last Ukrainian bear responsibility for that. Distinguished colleagues, I would like to underscore yet once again that Russia acts in, 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 in applicability of the, UN, of the UN principles, including the principle of territorial integrity of states. But this cannot be considered separately from other principles, and first and foremost, the principle of equality and self-determination of people. Their declaration on the principles of international law on friendly relations and cooperation among states in line with the UN Charter, which was passed by the General Assembly in 1970, to which the uh, sponsors of the resolutions um, refer, uh, quoting it um, um, selectively, states very clearly that territorial integrity applies to those states which in their, and in their acts abide by the principle of equality and self-determination of people and who therefore have governments which represent the entire people living in that territory. The Kiev regime is devoid of this leg legitimacy on the part of the Russian-speaking people in Ukraine in 2014 already after the Maidan coup. And for eight years, we have been providing thousands of pieces of evidence of its crimes against their own people, of how they impeded on the rights and violated the rights of the Russian-speaking people of Ukraine, or at least 40 percent of that country, of their attempts um, to forcibly Ukraine, Ukraine them. These are inconvenient facts. Uh, they're not in line with the unilateral Western narrative that's being imposed on you, at the same time twisting the arms of those who have their own opinions separate from the Western viewpoint. Those who managed to withstand this unprecedented pressure proved that they have their own opinion and are conducting a policy which is truly independent. They are the ones who abide by the most important principle of the uh, sovereign equality of member states. And, and that they speak um, on equal terms with, other, with others rather than a hegemon. It is a growth of such a state, is, or the number of such states that our Western opponents are mostly most afraid of and are doing everything to prevent this. Mr. President, since you didn't uh, enable us to do this in the normal rules when we ask for it, we demand that our, our proposal to suspend the rule of procedure number 87 as a whole be put to the vote, including its agenda item B, and that this be done now. I thank you. I thank the distinguished representative of the Russian Federation.
May I ask the distinguished representative of the Russian Federation to clarify exactly what Russia would like to put in motion? Mr. President, our proposal is that we suspend Rule 87 of the Rules of Procedure of the General Assembly so as to conduct the vote on the draft resolution through secret ballot.
Ladies and gentlemen, the distinguished representative of the Russian Federation has moved that Rule 87 be suspended in order to take a decision on Draft Resolution A-ES-11-L5 by secret ballot. This would constitute the reconsideration of the decision taken by the General Assembly to adopt the motion submitted by Albania. I wish to recall Rule 81 of the Rules of Procedure. Rule 81 provides as follows. When a proposal has been adopted to reject, uh, or rejected, it may not be reconsidered at the same session unless the General Assembly, by a two-thirds majority of the members present and voting, so decides. Permission to speak on a motion to reconsider shall be accorded only to two speakers opposing the motion, after which it shall be immediately put to vote. Pursuant to Rule 81 of the Rules of Procedure, up to two speakers opposing the motion by the Russian Federation for reconsideration may, uh, may make statements. Does any delegation opposing the motion by the Russian Federation wish to take the floor? I recognize the delegation of Albania. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm taking the floor to object to the request from the Russian Federation to hold the motion on this issue. As, you already, as we already said, we, we made the, uh, the decision, it's already made, and we don't see any reason to revisit this uh, decision. The motion was approved with 107 votes, and uh, we don't see it at this point any reason to vote on a new motion. We object to the Russian proposal to suspend the clearly applicable rules of procedure on voting. Thank you. I thank the distinguished representative of Albania. Now uh, I recognize the distinguished representative of Ukraine. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President. I believe it is a clear case of uh, abuse by one delegation of uh, the General Assembly manipulation with the rules of procedure. I think that the wish of the General Assembly was overwhelming. So we call on the Russian delegation to stop putting hurdles on the way of the General Assembly to carry on the decision after a very important debate that we will have, that we have in front of us. Thank you very much. I thank the distinguished representative of Ukraine. And before going to vote, uh, I recognize that the distinguished representative of the Russian Federation wants to speak on the point of order. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely correct, Mr. President. Indeed, I wanted to speak on the point of order. We disagree with the ruling that you have just voiced. Uh, um, rule 81 of the Rules of Procedure does not apply about the situation. We are talking about two different proposals. The proposal by Albania was to vote on the resolution under 87.B of the Rules of Procedure. And uh, into this, uh, there was an artificial link to the secret ballot, whereas what we are proposing is that our Rule 87 be suspended as a whole. These are two different proposals, not linked between themselves. And uh, the Article 70, 71 of the Rules of Procedure is the one that applies to our proposal. Thank you. I thank the distinguished representative of the Russian Federation.
Ladies and gentlemen, the distinguished representative of the Russian Federation has challenged the President's ruling that this is a reconsideration of the decision just taken. Rule 71 is applicable in this case, and the relevant parts of this rule states as follows. I quote, a representative may appeal against the ruling of the President. The appeal shall be immediately put to the vote, and the President's ruling shall stand unless overruled by, the, by a majority of the members present and voting. Thus, uh, I shall now put to a recorded vote the appeal that is a challenge against the President's ruling. May I point out that those who vote yes will be voting in favor of the challenge submitted by the rep distinguished representative of the Russian Federation. We shall now begin the voting process. Those in favor of the challenge by the distinguished representative of the Russian Federation against the President's ruling that this is a reconsideration of the decision just taken, please signify those against and abstention. The General Assembly is now voting on the challenge made by the representative of, of the Russian Federation. Those agreeing with the challenge made by the Russian Federation should press yes. Those disagreeing with the challenge by the Russian Federation should vote no. Will all delegations confirm that their votes are accurately reflected on the screen? The voting has been completed. Please lock the machine. The result of the vote is as follows. In favor of the appeal, 14. Against, 100. Abstention, 38. The ruling of the President is upheld. Ladies and gentlemen, since the President's ruling is upheld, the General Assembly will now vote on the motion to reconsider the decision adopted by the General Assembly. Those in favor of reconsidering the decision should vote yes. Those that are not in favor of reconsidering the motion should vote no. The General Assembly is now voting on the motion to reconsider the decision adopted earlier by the General Assembly. Those in favor of the reconsideration of the decision already taken, uh, taken earlier by the Assembly should vote yes. And those against such reconsideration should vote no.
will all delegations confirm that their votes are accurately reflected on the screen? The voting has been completed. Please lock the machine. The result of the voting is as follows. In favor, 16. Against, 104. Abstention, 34. The General Assembly has thus decided not to reconsider the motion. And now I give the floor. I recognize the Russian Federation uh, willing to take the floor on point of order. Absolutely correct, Mr. President. We will have uh, another opportunity to comment on the um, procedural points of uh, this meeting. I'm not going to spend more time on that. We've addressed this partially, but I wanted to say something else. And it is this. We are convinced uh, that we need to move on to making a decision on the um, um, draft uh, resolution. I'm extending this over several days, and we have a very long list of speakers. Determining uh, the issue of voting and then a decision on the resolution is a highly illogical step. Th such an approach would give additional opportunity to ha exert targeted pressure on those countries who had supported the secret secret ballot in uh, against uh, the Western wishes, and the assembly should not go along with those who should be twisting people's arms. Therefore, we um, propose. Pose, uh, um, and this is an official motion that we vote on the draft resolution now and not after we listen to all the speakers. Thank you. I thank the distinguished representative of the Russian Federation. May I ask uh, the distinguished representative of the Russian Federation uh, to clarify whether it has requested to close the debate under Rule 75 in order to proceed immediately to action on the draft resolution. No, Mr. President, you misunderstood us. We would like to ask you to announce the vote on the draft resolution now. We'll vote on that, and then we'll continue with the debate on the, on the issue. Thank you.
I think I understood uh, the point of the distinguished representative of the, uh, of the Russian Federation, and I intend to conduct the proceeding of this meeting in accordance with the rules of procedure of the General Assembly and the past practices of uh, its emergency, emergency uh, special sessions. And the practice of the General Assembly, including the emergency spe special session, uh, to proceed with the debate and then uh, come to the action on the uh, draft resolution. I recognize the distinguished representative of the Russian Federation willing to take the floor on point of order. Well, we are in admiration of our courageous decision, Mr. President. We would like to find out the following. The practice of the General Assembly, have there been instances where the decisions on the rules of procedure, including voting, were taking place at the beginning of the debate, and uh, then the uh, voting took place at the end of the debate, according to what you've just said. We cannot agree with the approach that you just put forward. It's illogical and inconsistent. Voting on a decision basically means that the Assembly moves over to the consideration of the draft resolution. Instead of doing that, we're going to have to wait possibly several days, possibly until Thursday. And it's only then that we will be able to vote on the resolution. And we do know who benefits from such a scenario, Mr. President. And it's unfortunate that you're playing into those hands. But uh, unfortunately, the only thing left to, to us at this stage is to express our regret at the decision that you made. And the assist uh, also goes uh, to all, all of the ways of conducting the proceedings. Uh, we regret them, all of the ways of conducting the proceedings that you have demonstrated today. I hear the opinion of the distinguished representative of the Russian Federation, and his opinion will be duly reflected in the records of the meeting. Uh, now we, we proceed uh, with the debate, and I offer the floor to the distinguished representative of Latvia, speaking on behalf of the Nordic and Baltic countries. Mr. President, honorable colleagues, I have the honor to speak on behalf of eight Nordic Baltic countries, Estonia, Denmark, Finland, Iceland, Lithuania, Norway, Sweden, and my own country, Latvia. Mr. President, February 24th this year, Russia launched its brutal full-scale invasion of Ukraine in blatant violation of international law and the UN Charter. By this war of aggression, aided by Belarus, Russia has deliberately violated the fundamental rights of all states to independence, sovereignty, and territorial integrity. Russia's military aggression and systematic violations of international humanitarian law and human rights and atrocities committed against the people of Ukraine constitute to cause grave human rights suffering in Ukraine as well as globally. Moreover, Russia has chosen further escalation. We resolutely condemn today's barbaric missile attacks on residential areas, power stations, railways, trade centers, and bridges in Kiev, Zaporizhia, Lviv, Dnipro, and other Ukrainian cities launched by Russia. There is no military purpose there. The only goal of Russia's deliberate attacks is to cause death and destruction to civilian people. With its military force, Russia has organized sham referenda 
as a pretext for a subsequent illegal attempt to annex four Ukrainian regions, Luhansk, Donetsk, Kherson, and Zaporizhia. Following the pattern of the attempted illegal annexation of Crimea, Ukraine, in 2014. We reiterate our unwavering support to Ukraine's independence, sovereignty, and territorial integrity within its internationally recognized borders. The unlawful Russian attempts to change the status of the temporarily occupied Ukrainian regions have no legal validity. We will never recognize the so called results and claimed consequences of these sham referenda. Russia's faulted attempts to validate voting at gunpoint goes against the core principles of international law, as also reiterated by the Secretary General on September 29, 2022. They are now and void and cannot produce any legal effect whatsoever. Mr. President, there is no such thing as legitimate referendum amidst brutal warfare and widespread and systematic violations of international humanitarian law, human rights violations and abuses. There is no such thing as a valid annexation of a state's territory by another state as a result of threats and direct use of force. In this respect, we recall that, under international law, all states are obliged not to recognize Russia's attempted illegal annexation of Ukrainian territory. Colleagues, Russia's unlawful war in Ukraine constitutes a direct attack on the rules-based international system and a threat to international peace and security. We will not accept this blatant violation of the core principles of the UN Charter and the suffering of millions in its wake. We will not accept Russia's unlawful behavior that jeopardizes international peace and security. We reject Russia's brutality in the strongest possible terms, and the international community will hold Russia accountable for its actions. There shall be no impunity. On Friday, September 30th, the Security Council draft resolution on the Shem referenda failed to be adopted due to a single member, Russia's casting its veto. We deeply regret this. We do, however, acknowledge the special report of the Security Council on the use of the veto, which informs us on discussions today. Mr. President, our stance is clear. A world without respect for sovereignty, territorial integrity, and the rules-based international order cannot stand. Therefore, we, firmly, we must firmly and collectively reject Russia's claim, sham referenda, and illegal attempt to annex any part of Ukrainian territory. We must collectively continue to insist that Russia completely and unilaterally withdraw its troops from the territory of Ukraine within its internationally recognized borders. Russia must comply, comply with the 16 of March order of the ICJ, which is binding on the parties, and stop its aggression against Ukraine. We must uphold the core principles of international law and the UN Charter, and we must underline that Russia's unacceptable threats on the use of nuclear weapons is in clear violation of the UN Charter and threatens international peace and security. Colleagues, we will continue to firmly stand with Ukraine and we will continue to provide support to Ukraine for as long as it takes. In line with the UN Charter and international law, Ukraine has the inherent right to defend its, itself against Russia's aggression and to restore its sovereignty within internationally recognized borders. We know what the annexation and occupation are. We have experienced it during and after the Second World War. Therefore, we must do everything possible to defend the UN Charter. The Nordic and Baltic countries will therefore vote in favor of this resolution, and we call on all member states to do the same. I thank you, Mr. President. I thank the distinguished representative of Latvia. And now I give the floor to the distinguished representative of Fiji speaking on behalf of the Pacific Island Forum. Mr. President, Excellencies, I have the honor to deliver this statement on behalf of member states of the Pacific Island Forum with presence here at the United Nations. This is the third time our forum members have addressed an emergency special session of this distinguished assembly regarding the ongoing illegal invasion of Ukraine 
by the Russian Federation. We spoke out to condemn the inv invasion. We spoke out in defense of civilian lives and humanitarian access. Today, we are here again to speak in defense of Ukraine's territorial sovereignty and integrity in light of Russian Federation's attempt to illegally annex four regions of eastern Ukraine, namely Donetsk, Luhansk, Kherson, and Zaporizhia. Mr. President, many islands and countries of our Blue Pacific continent are diverse with their own unique histories. However, there is much which unites us, including values of justice, fairness, and shared prosperity. Underpinning this unity is a shared belief in the value of the multilateral system enshrined in the UN Charter and its principles. The Russian Federation's attempted illegal annexation of parts of Ukrainian territory is a clear violation of the principles of the UN Charter and of international law. The Charter cannot simply be worn like a prestigious cloak only to be discarded when perceived geopolitical interests are at stake. Every instance of such behavior risks wearing it thin, dirtying it, and potentially even destroying it. Like our very air, water, and land, the Charter must be treasured if it is, if it is to, in turn, provide sustenance to our global family. The many states of the Blue Pacific continent understand this intimately. We also understand the terrible human and environmental cost of nuclear weapons in light of our region's history regarding nuclear testing. It is unacceptable that the use of nuclear weapons is openly threatened by a nuclear weapon state. We therefore strongly condemn Russia's latest threats to use nuclear weapons against Ukraine. We also strongly support international efforts to safeguard Ukrainian nuclear facilities against damage, intentional or otherwise. Mr. President, as a member of the Security Council, the Russian Federation has an even greater responsibility to uphold the Charter, the principles of sovereignty, dignity, and peaceful resolutions of all disputes. Our Pacific Islands Forum family thus calls for the Russian Federation to seize its attempted illegal annexation of Ukrainian territory, to de-escalate the current situation, and to withdraw behind its internationally recognized borders in order for a peaceful resolution to the conflict to be achieved. Such a resolution will not be found through coercion, violence, torture, bullets, and bombs. It will come through diplomacy, justice, and respect for the values, rules, and norms which sustain our global community and which animate these hollowed holes. From climate change to COVID recovery, hunger, and irretractable conflicts, there's simply too much at stake for this needless illegal war to continue to undermine our shared work. You have the full statement, Mr. President. I thank you very much. I thank the distinguished representative of Fiji. And now I give the floor to the distinguished representative of the European Union speaking on behalf of its member states. Thank you, President. Before delivering this statement, Allow me to say how appalled we are by the attacks carried out today by Russia against Kiev and other cities across Ukraine. Such indiscriminate attacks on civilians are war crimes, and we are committed to holding the perpetrators to account. President, I have the honor to speak on behalf of the EU and its member states. The candidate countries North Macedonia, Montenegro, Albania, Ukraine, and the Republic of Moldova the country of the stabilization association process and potential candidate Bosnia and Herzegovina, as well as Georgia, Andorra, Monaco, and San Marino, align themselves with this statement. We welcome the decision to reconvene this emergency special session. The past week, the European Union has facilitated a resolution to condemn Russia's organization of the illegal so-called referenda in regions within Ukraine's internationally recognized borders, as well as its subsequent attempted illegal, illegal annexation of Ukraine's regions of Donetsk, Luhansk, Kherson, and Zaporizhia. We want to sincerely thank all the delegations that engaged with us on this text. During a transparent and inclusive process, 
we have made every effort to include the proposals we have received from other delegations. We believe the result is a concise and focused text that all of us should be able to support. We therefore strongly encourage all UN member states to co-sponsor and vote in favor of the resolution. And in this respect, let me say that we are very grateful that this assembly has decided to follow its long established tradition of voting in a transparent manner. President, dear colleagues, this debate concerns every single one of us. Today's discussion is about upholding the Charter of the United Nations and the core principles of our organization. It is about respecting the most basic principles of international law. By willfully undermining the rules-based international order and blatantly and repeatedly violating Ukraine's independence, sovereignty, and territorial integrity, Russia is putting global peace and security at risk. If we do not condemn the actions of the Russian Federation in Ukraine today, we will end up condoning similar blatant attacks on any and all of our countries tomorrow. We therefore fir firmly reject and unequivocally condemn the attempted illegal annexation by Russia of Ukraine's Donetsk, Luhansk, Zaporizhia, and Kherson regions. Acquisition of territory through the use of force is a matter of concern for all of us. Protecting the sovereignty and territorial integrity of all UN member states, regardless of their size and their power, is our collective duty and a core principle of the UN Charter. President, we do not and will never recognize the illegal so-called referenda that Russia has engineered as a pretext for this further violation of Ukraine's independence, sovereignty, and territorial integrity, nor their falsified and illegal results. We will never recognize this attempted illegal annexation. These decisions are null and void and cannot produce legal effects under international law. Crimea, Kherson, Zaporizhia, Donetsk, and Luhansk are Ukraine. We call on all states and international organizations to unequivocally reject this attempted illegal annexation. Dear colleagues, the title of the resolution we're discussing today is Territorial Integrity of Ukraine, Defending the Principles of the Charter of the United Nations. That is the only thing we are voting on, and I strongly encourage all member states to stand up for the Charter. I thank you. I thank the distinguished representative of the European Union. And now I give the floor to the distinguished representative of Turkey. Mr. President, we thank you for convening yet another historic emergency special session of the General Assembly, a session that was called because of a war that must cease immediately, a session that was called because the Security Council failed once again to fulfill its primary responsibility. Mr. President, while the whole world is calling for an end to the war, we woke up once again to shocking news this morning. The attacks by Russia against several cities of Ukraine that resulted in civilian casualties today are deeply worrying and unacceptable. In the face of these news, we reiterate once again our strong support to Ukraine's territorial integrity, independence, and sovereignty. Mr. President, we also unequivocally reject the illegitimate referenda. Russia's decision to annex the Donetsk, Luhansk, Kherson, and Zaporizhia regions of Ukraine is illegal. It constitutes a grave violation of international law. It cannot be accepted. It has been eight years since the illegal annexation of Crimea. Since 2014, the human rights situation in the Crimean Peninsula has severely deteriorated. In particular, the human rights of the Crimean Tatars have been systematically 
targeted. The annexation of Crimea led to nothing but further damage, escalation, and instability in the region. It's not going to be different this time. The decision to annex Ukrainian territory will only serve to further jeopardize the prospects for peace. We call upon the Russian Federation to reverse its decision and to return to diplomacy. Mr. President, we all need the international law and a global order based on rules. It is our duty as member states to defend legality. It is our obligation to ensure that conflicts are resolved through peaceful means. We must collectively ensure that the founding principles of the UN enshrined in its charter are upheld. This is the only way to save ourselves from the scourge of war. With this understanding, Turkey has sponsored the draft resolution that will be put to vote this week. Mr. President, let me make it clear once again. We do not need, nor do we want, war in our region. This war should not have started. It should stop now. It should be brought to an end through negotiations. Together with the United Nations Secretary General, we helped the parties to reach a common understanding on the Grain Corridor Initiative. We can do more. As a neighbor to both parties, we call on them once again and reiterate our readiness to support and facilitate a peace process to end this war. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank the distinguished representative of Turkey. And now I give the floor to the distinguished representative of Singapore. Mr. President, it has been more than seven months since the Russian Federation, a permanent member of the Security Council, launched its invasion of Ukraine, an independent and sovereign nation, and a member of the United Nations. Singapore has taken a consistent position on the need to respect the sovereignty territorial integrity, and independence of all countries. The unjustified invasion of Ukraine by Russia is a flagrant violation of international law and the UN Charter. On the 1st of March this year, the General Assembly adopted a resolution with the support of an overwhelming majority of countries to reaffirm its commitment to the sovereignty, independence, unity, and territorial integrity of Ukraine. The resolution we adopted in March also demanded that Russia must immediately cease its use of force against Ukraine and completely and unconditionally withdraw all of its military forces from the territory of Ukraine. We are deeply disappointed and extremely concerned that after seven months, the war in Ukraine continues unabated. In fact, the war is escalating with mounting casualties. Russia's recent decision to organize referenda in four regions and its decision subsequently to annex these four regions within Ukraine's internationally recognized borders is a further escalation of the conflict. It is also a clear violation of international law and the principles of the UN Charter. The indiscriminate attacks launched by Russia last night on civilians across Ukraine is also clearly unacceptable. We entirely support and endorse the views of the UN Secretary General when he said that the annexation of a state's territory
by another state resulting from the threat or use of force is a violation of the principles of the UN Charter and of international law. The Secretary General added that any decision to proceed with the annexation of the Donetsk, Luhansk, Kherson, and Zaporizhia regions of Ukraine would have no legal value and deserves to be condemned. Mr. President, Singapore would like to reiterate its position that the sovereignty, political independence, and territorial integrity of all countries must be respected. The rules-based multilateral system is built on respect for international law and respect for the principles of the UN Charter. For small states like Singapore, the principles of the UN Charter and international law are not matters of academic debate. They are a matter of life and death. And a system based on the idea that might is right is simply unacceptable. Singapore has co-sponsored the resolution that has been placed before the General Assembly, and we will support its adoption by voting yes. And we will do so as a matter of principle. We believe it is important for the General Assembly to adopt this resolution by a clear majority and to send a clear signal to the world that international law must be respected, sovereignty must not be violated, and territorial integrity must be protected. Singapore would therefore like to urge all members of the General Assembly to vote in support of the resolution that has been placed before us today in the interest of upholding international law, upholding the principles of the UN Charter, and in the interest of upholding the rules-based multilateral system. I thank you for your attention. I thank the distinguished representative of Singapore. And now I give the floor to the distinguished representative of Costa Rica. Mr. President, there is a reason why we are meeting at this time in the General Assembly and not in the Trusteeship Council. That is, that states can no longer take other states. The prohibition of aggression and the prohibition on forced annexation of territory are peremptory norms of international law. The farcical September 30th referenda do not change the status of any Ukrainian territory. The right of peoples to self-determination enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and in Resolutions 1514 is inalienable and is the fundamental basis of the very existence of this international organization. Let us be clear. Donetsk is Ukraine, Lugansk is Ukraine, Kherson, Zaporizhia and Crimea are Ukraine. Aiding and abetting such violations are themselves international crimes. Ukraine is its own state, with its own peoples and its own democratically elected government. Costa Rica condemns in the strongest terms the shelling that ravaged Ukrainian communities across the country this weekend. Throughout the invasion against Ukraine, these, these attacks have typified the continued and complete disdain for human rights, humanitarian law and international norms. It is for that reason that at this time, what the international community must most fear is power with impunity. 
But we must not only fear power with impunity, we must also vanquish it with bravery. Impunity to not comply with international law, impunity to rely on military might, impunity to send thousands of civilians to a war that does not serve them and is not theirs, that turns its own people into pawns in a cruel and self-defeating charade. Costa Rica stands in solidarity with Ukraine and with the Russian people who do not benefit from this neo-imperial transgression but who are sent to die in its trenches in any case. Impunity is also failure to confront the painful and unjust truth of this war. We see this in the, in the way media rights and the freedom of speech have been severely curtailed since the beginning of the invasion of Ukraine. Journalists and media workers have been killed and injured rendered unable to carry out their essential work due to ongoing hostilities, to displacement and threats. Media outlets have been blocked and free communication and the freedom of expression has been censored. Journalists and media workers are the eyes and the ears on the ground that allow us to have a meaningful debate here in New York. Their freedom of opinion and expression is precious and must be preserved. Of course, freedom of expression is not the only human right to fall victim of this aggression. The recent reports of the UN Human Rights Monitoring Mission in Ukraine document thousands of civilians' deaths as well as the mass destruction of civilian infrastructure, summar summary executions, enforced disappearances, torture, sexual violence. There are many more offences that can be listed, but at this time there are just too many to count. In 2022, we should not have to explain that the prohibitions of torture, the arbitrary deprivation of life and of sexual violence are absolute in nature. Costa Rica calls upon all parties, no matter their affiliations, to comply with international law. Human rights violations must never be used as political means to an end, and when they are used as such, they must be documented and the perpetrators must be held accountable. For this reason, Costa Rica stresses its support for the investigation being conducted by the ICC of war crimes in Ukraine. Threatening to inflict nuclear force typifies the impunity to which I referred. It is all the more outrageous that the use of nuclear weapons is threatened in an attempt to weaken resistance to this brutal invasion. Threatening to use nuclear weapons is also illegal. Articles 2.4 and 2.3 of the UN Charter prohibit the threat of use of nuclear force and the use of force in general. For years, we have called for the reduction of nuclear stockpiles and for full compliance with the NPT. These calls have fallen on deaf ears. Nuclear weapons are not abstract concepts. They are concrete threats against all of us. The Ukrainians huddled in bomb shelters and subway stations know this all too well. When will the rest of us understand this fact? Consequently, we urge the Russian Federation to put an end to nuclear back blackmail and to abide by its obligations under international law. Mr. President, all wars are wars lost. Costa Rica calls on states to not only reject or not to recognize these supposed annexations. Rather, we call upon all states to cooperate to bring them to an end. We demand the prevalence of law over force, the absence of impunity, and a peaceful and negotiated solution. We also demand compliance with international law, respect for human rights, and the United Nations Charter. For this compliance, 
and these documents are the only way to resolve our problems. It is time to relinquish the aggression against Ukraine. I thank you. I thank the distinguished representative of Costa Rica. And now I give the floor to the distinguished representative of Poland. Mr. President, distinguished delegates, colleagues, today, today, since early morning, we have been further from a peaceful solution to the war in Ukraine. Massive Russian strikes against civilian infrastructure in multiple Ukrainian locations, justified by the spiteful Kremlin regime rhetoric of revenge, constitute yet another grim chapter of escalation caused by the aggressor. We cannot remain indifferent on, to these un unacceptable acts of terrorist nature. Mr. President, the Charter of the United Nations once again desperately needs our defense. This is why, one by one, big and small, we are taking the floor today strongly declaring, declaring our commitment to the Charter's values. This is why we are reiterating our support for the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine. This is why we are condemning the latest blatant violation of the very core principle of international order is based on. The Polish position is clear. Sham referenda are evidently illegal. They cannot produce any legal effect and they cannot lead into any binding action. A single vote in the Security Council over a week ago managed to obscure this reality. Fortunately, in this chamber, there is no veto right. All members are equal and have identical power of one vote. Let us make a good use of it, even more so when the Russian Federation tried a moment ago to deprive us all from the freedom of speech and expression before the vote. Mr. President, in principle, the upcoming, upcoming vote on the draft resolution presented by Ukraine should be indisputable, a strong and resounding yes. The states which do not recognize the independence of the so-called Donbas People's Republic should not recognize their attempted illegal incorporation to Russia. The former was just a pretext to accomplish the latter. Such behavior is a clear proof of the policy of the fait, fait accompli pursued by the Russian occupiers and their proxies, both in the past and in the present. Not condemning the attempted annexation means weakening the UN Charter and weakening the whole UN system. One cannot expect UN institutions to function efficiently if one votes not accordingly to the very foundation they were established upon. Those who undermine the Charter cannot at the same time expect that the UN system will deliver in the fields of, of such as peacekeeping, development, aid, or humanitarian assistance, just to name the few. On the other hand, voting in favor of the proposed resolution is a much desired sign of solidarity. Solidarity not only with Ukraine, but with all those who can share the same fate in the future. To us, Poland, this is a very embodiment of the UN Golden Rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Mr. President, therefore Poland once again calls to all member states to demonstrate their determination in defending the basic principles of international order. Let us reaffirm our enduring support for the territorial integrity of Ukraine, its sovereignty and independence. Dear delegates, the non-recognition of the Russian policy of the fait accompli is a precondition for diplomacy to work and peace talks to begin. And just peace is all what we desire. So let's reject the attempted illegal annexation and give peace a chance. Let's demonstrate that we stand by the UN Charter. Let's close ranks and vote yes. Yes for the UN system. Yes for the international solidarity. Thank you. I thank the distinguished representative of Poland. And now I give the floor to the distinguished representative of Indonesia. Mr. 
Mr. President, respect and adherence to international law, sovereignty, and territorial integrity are fundamental and a principled position for Indonesia. It is crystal clear for us that the settlement of disputes between country must and can only be resolved through peaceful means in accordance to international law. Only genuine dialogue can bring lasting solution. War brings us nowhere. The war in Ukraine is evident that only death, destructions, and human miseries are winning. Events in the last few hours and days further confirms this. Therefore, we reiterate our call to stop the war. While we welcome the efforts of the Secretary General and of some countries to bring the parties to dialogue and to the negotiating table, the international community must work harder to ensure that peace prevails. We have to aggressively wage peace. Peace must be our ultimate aim and priority. Mr. President, as the war in Ukraine persists and its response takes hold, the number of casualties and refugees continues to surge. Moreover, the war has also caused far-reaching consequences. Billions of people, particularly the poor around the world, have become unintended victims of the war. Increasing costs of grain and fertilizer perpetuated by the war contribute to the worsening of global food, energy, and financial crisis. The Secretary General has referred to this as a one in, in, in a generation global cost of living crisis in which developing countries are disproportionately affected. It is not too late for us to choose an alternate path. Ending the war is the only way to save lives and to ease the suffering of innocents around the world. The unity of the General Assembly is needed more than ever in addressing the wider humanitarian impact of this war. Mr. President, the referendum of four regions in Ukraine not only violates the principle of the UN Charter and international law, it also further complicates effort to peacefully resolve the conflict. As the highest decision-making body of the United Nations, the General Assembly must resolutely demonstrate its political leadership, including in the outcomes and resolution it produces. We must ensure that the General Assembly do not only represent the political aspiration of the few. We must also avoid a take-it-or-leave-it approach. We therefore deeply regret that inputs calling to stop the war and for the immediate and peaceful resolution of conflicts in Ukraine failed to be reflected in the final draft of today's re resolution. We remain convinced that lasting peace can only be achieved on the negotiating table. We should not let efforts to finding peaceful solution be held back by divisions and distrust. Indonesia stands ready to engage constructively, including through promoting conducive environment for peace. I thank you, Mr. President. I thank the distinguished representative of Indonesia. And I, I give uh, the floor to the distinguished representative of Malta. Mr. President, Malta fully supports the resumption of this emergency special session following the use of the veto by the Russian Federation on 30th September. Malta aligns herself with the statement delivered by the European Union and would like to add a few remarks in her national capacity. At the outset, Malta condemns the most recent attacks by Russia against Kiev and other cities across Ukraine. Such indiscriminate attacks on civilians are war crimes and the perpetrators must be held to account. Mr. President, 
As a member of the core group of the Veto Initiative, we remain firm in our belief that the General Assembly has a duty to react to the violations of international law which are being propagated in Ukraine. Malta strongly condemns and rejects attempts by Russia to illegally annex the Donetsk, Luhansk, Zaporizhia and Kherson regions of Ukraine through the holding of the sham referenda. These so-called results constitute a serious and dangerous escalation. They are a blatant violation of Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity and, a show, and, a show, com, and show complete disregard to the fundamental principles of international law. The UN Security Council is entrusted with the maintenance of international peace and security. It, this is a responsibility it cannot shirk. The use, or rather the abuse, of the veto by the aggressor in an attempt to consolidate such acts is reprehensible. It is something that the rest of the UN membership must strongly reject. As incoming members of the Security Council, we stand committed to safeguarding these principles. Equally reprehensible is the rhetoric and threats concerning the use of nuclear weapons. Together, we need to reaffirm our steadfast commitment to the rules-based international order. We must act in a decisive and unequivocal man manner to protect the UN Charter. This is our collective responsibility. We urge all member states to vote in favour of the resolution we have in front of us today. It is concise and to the point and addresses recent development developments in a factual manner. The costs of the war in Ukraine have reached far beyond Europe and are being felt worldwide, most acutely when it comes to the unfolding food and energy crisis. Mr. President, today the General Assembly has the opportunity to send an important message to the world that the violation of international law and the sovereignty of states is not tolerated. These are the principles the founding members of the United Nations had agreed to 77 years ago. They are the principles we have all signed up to. Today, it is our duty to reaffirm them and counter contempt for them. Thank you. I thank the distinguished representative of Malta. And now I give the floor to the distinguished representative of the Netherlands. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, the Kingdom of the Netherlands aligns itself with the statement just made by the European Union. And I thank you, Mr. President, for reconvening this emergency special session, for recognizing that these are not ordinary times. Mr. President, we are here nearly eight months after Russia unleashed its war of aggression against Ukraine. Eight months since this assembly demanded that the Russian Federation, and I quote, immediately, completely, and unconditionally withdraw all of its military forces from the territory of Ukraine within its internationally recognized borders. Eight months that have brought hardship and food insecurity to people across the globe, plunging millions of the world's most vulnerable into hunger and poverty. And we are here because like, just like eight years ago with its illegal annexation of Crimea Russia decided to ignore the calls of the international community and went ahead with the organization of illegal referenda in areas temporarily under its occupation. Russia did what the Secretary General warned not to do and proceeded with the Ill illegal annexation of Ukrainian territory. And I want to state clearly, the Kingdom of the Netherlands will never recognize the Shem referenda and the attempted illegal annexation of Ukrainian territory. Crimea, Kherson, Saporizhia, Donetsk, and Luhansk are Ukraine. The Kingdom of the Netherlands stands firmly with Ukraine and will continue to provide support for as long as it takes. As we will continue to support people all over the world 
who are suffering the effects of this war indirectly, from hunger and poverty to economic instability. Also for this suffering, we must hold Russia to account. Mr. President, it is up to us, the Member States of the United Nations, to stand firm for the principles we laid down in the UN Charter, to make clear that might is not right, that all of us are bound by the same fundamental principles, and that a veto does not provide a blank check. Our international rule book is no longer just in jeopardy, it has been trampled by a permanent member of the Security Council. This is something none of us should accept. So today's meeting is about defending the principles of this international rule book and the Charter, about protecting the legal frameworks aimed at securing peace, justice and human rights. Those responsible for violating the Charter and for committing atrocities must be held to account. The Kingdom of the Netherlands, with The Hague as the legal capital of the world, feels a special responsibility in this regard, and we will not waver in our efforts to achieve justice for those who suffer from sexual violence, deportation, torture, and random killing. Mr. President, in conclusion, this is a war of destruction. Destruction, as we have sadly seen again early this morning with horrific missile strikes on cities across Ukraine, including the capital Kiev, targeting innocent civilians and civilian infrastructure, which we condemn in the strongest terms. As you just stated, Mr. President, the fighting must stop. So we renew our call on Russia to abide by the legally binding provisional measures ordered by the International Court of Justice to immediately suspend its military operations and respect internationally recognized borders. As I said at this same place seven months ago, this war needs to end, and it needs to be ended by those who started it. I therefore call on all UN member states to vote in favor of the resolution, to vote to respect the territorial integrity of our fellow UN member state Ukraine, and to vote to defend the principles of our own charter. I thank you, Mr. President. I thank the distinguished representative of the Netherlands. And now I give the floor to the distinguished representative of Luxembourg. Monsieur le Président. Mr. President, Luxembourg fully aligns itself with the statement made by the European Union. Allow me to supplement that statement with these remarks made in our national capacity. I wish to reaffirm the full solidarity of Luxembourg with the government and people of Ukraine. Luxembourg condemns in the strongest terms the Russian aggression against Ukraine. We condemn the deadly missile attacks that were launched by the Russian Federation against civilians in Kyiv and other Ukrainian cities. The atrocities, the atrocities committed by Russian armed forces in Ukraine may constitute war crimes and crimes against humanity. We must do everything in our power to hold perpetrators accountable and to bring justice to victims. Luxembourg also condemns the attempted illegal annexations of the Ukrainian regions of Donetsk, Luhansk, Kherson and Zaporizhia by Russia. These regions, like Crimea, constitute an integral part of Ukrainian territory within its internationally recognized borders. As a result of the Russian veto during the vote held on 30th of September, the Security Council was once again unable to take the decisions necessary to shoulder its primary responsibility for the maintenance of international peace and security. Mr. President, I thank you for convening for resuming, rather, this emergency special session of the General Assembly. This is a meeting which allows all member states of the United Nations to speak on a subject which is of concern to us all, that is, the respect of the United Nations Charter and of international law. Faced with the Security Council's paralysis, paralysis, it is now up to the General Assembly to rally for an international order based on the rule of law and not on the principle of might is right. 
the illegal annexation orchestrated by Russia and the sham referenda that preceded it constitute a flagrant violation of the United Nations Charter and of the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine. In these very difficult times, we cannot recall often enough the text of Article 2.4 of the Charter. The All members shall refrain in their international relations from the threat or use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of any state or in any other manner inconsistent with the purposes of the United Nations. The Secretary General expressed his view Unequivocally, any annexation of the territory of one state by another state as a result of the threat or use of force constitutes a violation of the principles of the United Nations Charter and of international law, and any decision taken by Russia to move to the annexation of the regions of Donetsk, Luhansk, Kherson and Zaporizhia has no legal value and must be condemned. It has no place in the modern world. Luxembourg co-sponsored and will vote in favour of the draft resolution of the General Assembly entitled Territorial Integrity of Ukraine, defending the principles of the UN Charter. It is a concise and targeted text which is the fruit of a transparent process, and Luxembourg, well, Luxembourg rather, calls upon all states who hold dear the respect of the United Nations Charter and of international law to support this draft. What's happening today to U Ukraine can happen in other countries tomorrow if the perpetrators of this aggression are not held accountable for their acts and if there is no resolute and united response from the international community in the face of this flagrant violation of the territorial integrity of a sovereign nation. I thank you. I thank the distinguished representative of Luxembourg. And now I give the floor to the distinguished representative of Dominican Republic. Thank you very much, Mr. President. The Dominican Republic reiterates its commitment to the principles and values enshrined in the United Nations Charter. To accept and to see almost normalized an international landscape in which the United Nations Charter is consistently violated is a source of grave concern. Violations of the United Nations Charter produce one thing only, suffering and human desperation. In his recent statement before the general debate of this General Assembly, our ministry, Minister rather, for Foreign Affairs stated the following. Unfortunately, events such as the invasion of Ukraine by Russia have created not only dismay at the loss of human life, but also have created a dangerous spike in hunger in several regions, several of these far removed from the conflict zone." End quote. The recent events in this conflict confirm that far from letting up, this conflict threatens to expand and worryingly, increasingly spaces for dialogue and the negotiation of a peaceful solution to the conflict are narrowing. This began to occur once Russia removed, uh, moved to decree the annexation of territories that are part of Ukraine, and once it declared that any negotiation would not include Russian recognition of Ukrainian sovereignty over the annexed territories. For the Dominican Republic, as must be the case for the vast majority of member states of the United Nations, having to discuss this issue is painful particularly because what we are discussing is a situation which involves the violation of human rights in general, a situation which more directly affects the people in the area of the conflict unleashed by the Russian military aggression against Ukraine, but a situation which, moreover, places the entire world on the brink of disaster. In this tragedy, what is most difficult to endure is the violation of human rights and the fact that the Security Council has found itself unable to act because it does not have a safeguard which allows it to condemn these human rights violations. This situation has been declared as an abuse of the right of veto.
As such, we have no other alternative than to use this General Assembly to appeal to the common sense and good conscience of the parties involved, to negotiate a peaceful solution to the conflict, to respect the principle of sovereignty and territorial integrity of states, and to guarantee the respect of human rights in their entirety. Many thanks indeed, Mr. President. I thank the distinguished representative of the Dominican Republic. And now I give the floor to the distinguished representative of Albania. Thank you, Mr. President. We meet again in this special emergency session since the unprovoked and unjustified Russian aggression in Ukraine has not stopped. Actually, it has worsened. The sham referendums in Luhansk, Donetsk, Kherson, and Zaporizhia, organized in a rush and at gunpoint and the follow-up annexation have demonstrated to everyone, including the most skeptics, that for Russia, there is no international law. There is no UN charter, and there is no Ukrainian constitution. Albania will not recognize the sham referenda and their pretended results. No one should. They have no legitimacy and no legal effect. Luhansk, Donetsk, Kherson, and Zaporizhia are and will remain Ukrainian territories, and we stand in full support to the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine in its internationally recognized borders. Colleagues, we heard today again the Russian Federation trying to draw similarities between the independence of the Republic of Kosovo and the sham referenda and its illegal annexation of four regions in Ukraine. This is wrong and cynical. Comparing an international effort to end the conflict, protect civilians, and establish a peace process to find a lasting solution, which was the case of Kosovo, with a pure and unprovoked aggression and the sham referendum engineered in Moscow and carried out in Ukraine is more than artificial. No attempt to compare the incomparable, no easy shortcuts out of any historical and political context will help Russia divert attention from its war of choice in Ukraine or hide its bland breach of international law. In defending the UN Charter, a few days ago, Albania and U.S. tabled a draft resolution in the Security Council. Again, only one country voted against and blocked the Council to act. Only one country was on the other side, isolated, disconnected from reality, hiding behind the misuse of the veto. It was the aggressor country. This is why we are here today at the UNGA, the community of peace-loving countries who respect the UN Charter and uphold the international law. Russia cannot veto the UNGA. By voting in favor of the resolution, we vote for rules, for order, for justice, for core principles, for peace and security. We cannot allow ourselves to be indifferent, and abstain cannot be a choice. We should say no to the aggression, we should say no to the annexation of territory by force. We should say no to this behavior. This is why we call on the members of the GA to vote for the resolution as presented. And I thank you. I thank the distinguished representative of Albania. And now I give the floor to the distinguished representative of Austria. Mr. President, Austria aligns itself with the statement delivered by the European Union. Excellencies, dear colleagues, we meet here today to discuss yet another attempt by the Russian Federation to undermine the sovereignty and territorial integrity of its neighbor, Ukraine. An attack on one nation, but also an attack on the United Nations Charter, 
on international law on the foundations that have guided the relations between states for over seven decades. The Secretary General has made it crystal clear this is a matter that concerns us all. These annexations cannot be reconciled with the international legal framework. They flout the purposes and principles of the UN Charter. They must not be accepted. I would like to thank the Secretary General and the President of the General Assembly for their very clear statements in defense of the UN Charter and the sovereignty of Ukraine. No state can stand on the sidelines while the basic principles of our legal order are undermined. Do we want to live in a world where might prevails over the rule of law? I don't think so. It is therefore our duty to come together today and call for an end to these illegal acts. This is critical to all of us, but even more so to neutral countries like my own. The so-called referenda that Russia organized in Donetsk, Kherson, Luhansk, and Saporizhia to prepare this attempted annexation were equally void of any legal basis. Let me be clear, these sham referenda cannot be called a genuine expression of the popular will. They lack legitimacy under international law and will not be recognized by us. There's also another reason why we meet today. The fact that the Security Council was yet again unable to act on this matter because Russia used its veto power. For the past few months, the Council has been unable to act on what is undoubtedly the biggest threat to international security in decades. It is thereby failing to implement its mandate. Resolution 76-262, the so-called veto initiative, was explicitly passed this year to address such situations and we welcome the report that the Security Council submitted to this debate today. I would like to reiterate our call that the failure of the Security Council to act in such grave situations is a predicament that needs to be discussed. The new agenda for peace of the Secretary General will be an opportunity to do so. But until then, the General Assembly needs to continue to step up. It is clear what needs to be done. The General Assembly must send a strong signal that the world does not accept this blatant breach of the Charter. It must make clear that the so-called referenda were illegal, that the annexation does not have an illegal basis, and that it must not be accepted, not even implicitly. This is exactly what the resolution presented to the Assembly proposes. It has been consulted with all regional groups in a transparent and inclusive manner. We will therefore vote in favor and encourage all of you to do the same. I cannot close without referring to the suffering that this war has caused in over seven months. Thousands of civilians have been killed. Millions of people had their lives and livelihoods uprooted. The Russian attacks against civilian infrastructure in Kyiv and other parts of Ukraine in the past days are utterly un unacceptable and must stop. The protection of civilians is not a choice, but a duty under, under international law. We have seen reports of unimaginable horrors. In Bucha, Mariupol, in Izium, previously peaceful cities that have now become associated with war crimes, torture, rape, and mass killings. These crimes must be investigated and perpetrators held to account. We fully support all efforts to do so including by the ICC and the Commission of Inquiry based in Vienna. The senseless Russian aggression has plunged the whole world into peril. Food shortages, soaring energy prices, and nuclear blackmail serve Russia's sole purpose of trying to subdue its neighbor, with devastating consequences for the most vulnerable nations. And let me say one word on the threat of nuclear weapons. A nuclear threat is a clear violation of the principles of the UN Charter, this is completely unacceptable. Austria categorically rejects any and all nuclear threats, irrespective of the circumstances. This underscores the urgency of progress, also on nuclear disarmament, and of moving away from the nuclear deterrence paradigm. Mr. President, we call on Russia once again to stop this war, withdraw its troops from the whole territory of Ukraine, and end the bloodshed. There must be a return to meaningful negotiations and a sustainable negotiated solution. 
This is the only path to peace. Austria stands in full solidarity with Ukraine, the Ukrainian government, and the Ukrainian people. And colleagues, we once again call on all of you to vote yes on the General Assembly resolution to be adopted at the end of this debate, to defend the Charter, to defend international law. I thank you. I thank the distinguished representative of Austria. And now I offer the floor to the distinguished representative of Liechtenstein. Mr. President, again, we meet in an emergency special session due to a further escalation of Russia's aggression against Ukraine. Since its very beginning in 2014, this aggression has gone hand in hand with an attempt to deface the fundamental concepts of international law and the basic tenets of the UN Charter beyond all recognition. But the law is clear. We in this hall must uphold it, not only for the sake of Ukraine, but also to safeguard the international order to maintain peace and security. Mr. President, this assembly unanimously agreed on a definition of aggression in 1974 at the height of the Cold War. The very first of the acts listed in that definition is, I quote, the invasion or attack by the armed forces of a state of the territory of another state or any annexation by the use of force of the territory of another state or part thereof, end of quote. Russia's attempt to forcibly annex Ukrainian territory is thus the latest constitutive act of aggression, for which international law provides for individual crim criminal responsibility, responsibility that falls on the Russian leadership. It is incumbent on us in this hall to ensure such accountability for the sake of justice, but also critically for future deterrence. This is why we, as many others, advocate for a special tribunal for the crime of aggression we appeal to all states to join this effort in our common interest to maintain internationally agreed borders and avert future aggression. Mr. President, in its attempt to deny the, real the reality of its aggression, Russia violates the foundational precepts of international law and of the UN Charter. It violates the prohibition of illegal use of force in the most brazen manner. It undermines the principle of territorial integrity, which is of vital importance for the maintenance of international peace and security. And it makes a mockery of the right of self-determination, which allows people to freely determine their political status. Russia's attempt to fabricate election results through blackmail and intimidation, and the use of illegal so-called referenda to justify the redrawing of Ukraine's internationally recognized borders by force evokes the worst memories of colonial oppression and imperialism. Mr. President, these violations are not simply improvisational tactics. They are the latest example of a well-known playbook. In 2014, when Russia attempted to annex Crimea, it also sought to justify its aggression through a sham referendum. In Syria, as in Chechnya before, it will, its relentless targeting of civilians goes hand in hand with support for so-called strongmen through rigged elections and elimination of political opposition. Russia seeks to construct an alternative reality based on this information, distorting our shared norms and values while claiming to invoke them. We must coll collectively resist this attempt and speak truth to brute force. Mr. President, this assembly will soon vote on a text that condemns the illegal attempt to annex parts of Ukrainian territory, a continuation of Russia's aggression against Ukraine. Our consideration of this text is also an opportunity for member states to again speak up in defense of the Charter of the United Nations of Territorial Integrity, 
the sovereignty of states, genuine self-determination, and the rule of law. We therefore hope that all of you will join us in voting in favor of this resolution. I thank you. I thank the distinguished representative of Liechtenstein. And now I give the floor to the distinguished representative of Switzerland. Monsieur le Président, avant... Mr. President, before sharing my speech with you, please allow me to, to condemn with the sadness, but also in the strongest possible terms, the attacks, the current attacks against civilians in several Ukrainian cities and express our condolences, heartfelt condolences to the victims and their family. Switzerland calls on Russia to immediately stop the strikes. Mr. President, today we are meeting again for a special emergency session to consider a draft resolution called uh, Territorial Integrity of Ukraine, defending the principles of the Charter. In uh, uh, normal times, we should have never found ourselves here discussing or even voting on such a draft resolution because this is not a matter that is obvious, respect for the territorial integrity of any country, but it is also a fundamental principle of the UN Charter and of relations between member states. We are therefore here to reaffirm the values and principles of our Charter and to call for respect for international law. In international order, which is rules-based, is of great importance for small and medium-sized countries uh, such as Switzerland and uh, the absolute majority of states in this assembly. We cannot tolerate uh, that the power of uh, the one who is strongest prevails over the rights of the weakest. The respect for the Charter is the basis for the security and prosperity of the whole international community, and protecting it is therefore an existential need for all of us, everywhere and always. Mr. President, more than seven months after the beginning of Russia's military aggression against Ukraine, we are confronted with a new serious violation of international law, namely, um, annexation of Ukrainian territory by Russia violates the territorial integrity and sovereignty of Ukraine. Switzerland does not recognize the integration of Ukrainian territories into the Russian Federation, and we call on Russia to de-escalate and to withdraw its forces completely and immediately from Ukrainian territory. Mr. President, in addition to the direct effects of Russia's military aggression, the consequences of this conflict are felt across the world. And this is in a situation where the world needs unity to face the huge challenges ahead. The effects are also felt here, in this building, and in this very hall, not only in sessions like the one we are um, attending today, but also, more generally speaking, they manifest themselves in tensions, divisions, and growing polarization among member states. And these tensions threaten the necessary compromises, the compromises we need to move forward and to find solutions. And therefore, these tensions threaten us all. We note with concern um, some fears, according to which calling for respect for international law and holding violators accountable could be unfavorable to de-escalation and the search for solutions. We strongly reject uh, this idea. International law must prevail at all times, especially in times of uh, political crisis and unrest. Respect for international law is an essential condition for lasting peace. It is difficult to speak of peace when war is raging, when unspeakable pain is being caused, and when the future is uncertain for the young people in Ukraine, Russia, and elsewhere in the world um, who are suffering the consequences of this war. And yet, peace is what we must aspire to. Let us reject today the narratives of hate. Let us fight against the creation of untruths, against the systematic disinformation that divides us. Let us send a clear signal in favor of facts, of international law, and of responsibility for those who violate it. Switzerland strongly condemns the continuous Russian attacks on residential areas in various Ukrainian cities. Switzerland calls on Russia to immediately stop these indiscriminate attacks. Civilians are protected by international humanitarian law. Switzerland is 
strongly concerned about the humanitarian consequences of the armed conflict in Ukraine and the thousands of victims it is creating. The respect of international humanitarian law by all parties is crucial to limit these humanitarian consequences. Switzerland reiterates its call for strict respect of international humanitarian law and human rights. The protection of the civilian population and persons who are hors de combat is an obligation and must be ensured. We encourage initiatives in this regard, and we call for rapid and unhindered access of humanitarian assistance throughout the territory of Ukraine and in the areas occupied. Paid, occupied by Russia. In line with its humanitarian tradition, Switzerland reiterates its offer of good offices. In this spirit, Switzerland also expresses, as is stated in the um, operative paragraph 7 of the resolution under consideration, its strong support for the efforts of the Secretary General to de-escalate the situation. The United Nations has a unique and universal platform for dialogue and cooperation if we, member states, remain united in defending its values and principles. Mr. President, Switzerland is a neutral country. Neutrality makes us refrain from providing military support, but neutrality does not prevent us from mobilizing for international law, for international humanitarian law, for the United Nations Charter and its principles. All of us in this hall have a collective responsibility to defend what unites us, what unites the United Nations. Therefore, Switzerland supports the, and co-sponsors the draft resolution proposed by Ukraine and calls on all member states to do the same. I thank you very much. I thank the distinguished representative of Switzerland. And now I give the floor to the distinguished representative of the United Kingdom. Mr. President, Excellencies, in February, the General Assembly met in an emergency special session to condemn Russia's illegal invasion of Ukraine. And today, we meet again to condemn Russia's sham referenda and attempted illegal annexation of the Ukrainian regions of Kherson, Zaporizhia, Luhansk, and Donetsk, the largest forcible annexation attempt since the Second World War. Putin is trying to take Ukraine's land, its resources, its identity. In doing so, he is overturning the most sacred principle in the international system, that borders cannot be drawn by force. Over seven months into the war, the whole world understands the terrible cost of Russia's invasion. In Ukraine, families count that cost in the bodies exhumed from mass graves, in the rubble of flattened towns and the lost education for millions of innocent children, and in the growing list of friends and relatives detained or forcibly deported through Russia's filtration process. Even this morning, millions across Ukraine awoke to the sound of air raid sirens as Russia carried out one of the largest bombardments of civilian areas and infrastructure in the war. Around the world, people and governments are suffering from the unaffordable cost of higher food and energy prices. As a result of Russia's invasion, everyone's lives have been made more difficult and more insecure. And here in New York, we also see the cost in terms of damage to the UN Charter. The UN Charter 
enshrines the principle that no threat or use of force shall be made against the territorial integrity or political independence of any state. We have no way to resolve disputes or achieve the fundamental goals of the UN if we concede this principle. If any rogue head of state can, by force or fiat, change the borders of another UN member. This Assembly's call on Russia since the start of its illegal invasion has been simple. End this war and withdraw from Ukraine. For the sake of Ukraine, Russia and the entire UN membership, we reiterate this call today. We call on Russia to end the war and honour the UN Charter. Colleagues, at the end of this debate, we will have an opportunity to vote on a resolution to condemn Russia's so-called referenda and illegal annexation. We urge everyone here to vote in support of international law, the sovereignty and territorial integrity of all states and the UN Charter. We urge all members to vote yes on the resolution. I thank you. I thank the distinguished representative of the United Kingdom and now I give the floor to the distinguished representative of Mexico. Señor, uh, presi Mr. President, Excellencies, we convey our gratitude for the special report presented by the Security Council pursuant to Resolution 76-262 of this General Assembly, a resolution which remains applicable to the case under consideration today. Once again, a veto in the Security Council brings us together in this Assembly. This was the veto, as has been said, used by the Russian Federation on the 30th of September during the vote on the draft resolution S-2022-720 on the so-called referenda held recently in Ukrainian territory in the regions of Donetsk, Luhansk, Kherson and Zaporizhia with a view to their subsequent annexation. Mexico voted in favour of that draft resolution as an elected member of the Security Council and we will do the same in this General Assembly. And this position is grounded in our unwavering commitment to and support for stringent compliance with international law, in particular with the principle of the prohibition of territorial expansion through the use of force or through other actions inconsistent with the Charter of the United Nations. As we have stated since the day Russians' invasion of Ukraine was confirmed last February, Mexico, as an independent country, has been a victim of four military invasions and, as a consequence of one of them, it lost around half of its national territory. As such, Mexico cannot, under any circumstances, allow another country in its turn to fall victim of this type of acts of aggression. 
In recent weeks, we have seen the emergence of the idea that there is an apparent tension between the right to the self-determination of peoples and states' right to territorial integrity. It is as if we were talking about dichotomous notions and as if the international community were forced to prioritise one over another. For my country, there is no such dilemma. If we understand international law as a system in which these principles are applied according to the criteria and conditions unique to specific situations, there is no place for false dichotomies and far less for interpretations which allow one of these principles to be invoked in open violation of the United Nations Charter. The above was clearly established in Resolution 2625 of the General Assembly. This resolution states that the enjoyment and of the right to self-determination cannot be construed, and I quote, as authorising or encouraging any action which would dismember or impair in whole or in part the territorial integrity of sovereign and independent states, end quote. In sum, this norm of international law which is grounded in the United Nations Charter itself and which has been endorsed so strongly by the General Assembly and by the Security Council as well as by the jurisprudence of the ICJ means that the so-called referenda held in the occupied territories in Ukraine lack all legal validity. Furthermore, the fact that this exercise was conducted in a territory enduring a military invasion means that any expression of popular will here is null and void. Mexico defends the sovereignty, the, the national unity rather, independency and integrity, territorial integrity of Ukraine within its internationally recognised borders. And we have done just that since the very beginning of this war. Any attempt at territorial annexation constitutes an escalation of the armed conflict, including a nuclear threat or nuclear accident. Insofar as n there is no de delineation of a secure perimeter around the nuclear power plant of Zaporizhia, and insofar as there are no guarantees given for the safety of any other, the recent attacks on civilian infrastructure which run counter to international humanitarian law, worsen day by day the seriousness of the conflict and increase the costs of the war borne by civil society. Against this backdrop, it is not only necessary but rather urgent to see the continuance of the efforts of the Secretary-General and of other possible international actors capable of convening a truce, efforts that is to encourage dialogue, to resume diplomacy, and to find political pathways that can put an end to the war, as my country has proposed time and time again. I conclude by undoubtedly expressing agreement with the majority of states here present regarding the importance that the General Assembly speak out clearly regarding the cause of this emergency special session. It is not possible, through a veto, to eliminate nor to discredit the edifice of legal rules and institutions that we have built collectively within our organisation. The rules and institutions whose only purpose is to ensure the peaceful coexistence of nations of the world. The ill-titled right of veto has been present in the discussions of the, this General Assembly since the very inception of the United Nations. It is time to find a collective and systemic, systematic rather, solution to restrict the use of the veto in specific circumstances. We invite delegations that have not yet done so to consider the Franco-Mexican initiative 
ensuring the voluntary suspension of the veto in the case of mass atrocities, and we encourage these delegations to sign it. The initiative already has 106 signatory states. The real dilemma that we are grappling with in the context of this emergency session is whether we do or do not wish to do something more effective so as to avoid that this re circumstance which is so regrettable continues to occur time and time again. Many thanks indeed. I thank the distinguished representative of Mexico. Ladies and gentlemen, we have heard the last speaker in the debate on this item for this meeting. We shall hear the remaining speakers on Wednesday morning 12th of October at 10 o'clock a.m. in this hall. This meeting is adjourned. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr.